Uh, good morning, Outreach. So I'm going to try uh, our technology again here and see if we can't walk through this uh, plant. <clears throat> Most of these videos are body and paint. That's not exactly where my expertise is, so I thought we'd walk through that. So wish me luck with this. Uh-oh, need volume. Now look left. These 18 state-of-the-art framing robots are quick, nimble, and most importantly, they weld with surgical precision, allowing us to make sure the core of the car is stronger and more reliable than ever before. Hidden within the edges of the 200s roof is one of the unsung heroes of modern car making, laser braze seams. And yes, laser brazing is as cool as it sounds and just as modern. Unlike spot welding, which involves dozens of small welds, these laser brazing robots carefully bond the entire edge of the roof with one long weld. Like the zipper on a jacket, laser brazing tightly bonds the two pieces of material together, leaving no gaps or holes. This not only dramatically reduces noise and vibration when driving, but also makes for a stronger, longer lasting seal around the roof. Plus, it eliminates the need for additional sealing and all that unsightly weather stripping. The result, a stronger, better looking car. Any robot can lift and attach heavy panels, but it takes a special robot to do it with absolute precision. That's where these automated panel robots come in. As well as being able to lift more than two tons of steel, their tiny sensors allow them to actually see the car body they're assembling, and then adjust their position accordingly, right down to the tenth of a millimeter. That means every door, every trunk, and every hood panel is perfectly fitted into place for smooth and easy movement now and less wear and tear down the road. Once assembled, only one stop in the body shop remains, the touch test. In the final stages of the body shop, this team of trained craftsmen run their fingers along the surface of each and every car, which is the only way to be absolutely sure that the exterior of every car meets the high standards of an American craftsman. Once the car has passed the full body exam with flying colors, it's deemed ready for painting and transported to the next part of the factory. In the final stages of the body shop, this team of trained craftsmen run their fingers over This machine measures, wait, let's speed things up and add some music. That's better. This machine measures more than 2,000 individual points on the car's body, right down to the last micron. Something smaller than a human hair might seem insignificant, but this level of accuracy is needed to make sure every panel and part fits together just right. This is important when the car is new, but it becomes even more important over its lifetime. Did we mention there's a red ruby fitted to the end of each of those measurement probes? Apart from being a precious jewel, ruby also happens to be one of the hardest materials on earth. This means that the tips never wear down, so each insanely small measurement is always accurate. Impressive stuff, right? Oh, and that's Ron. He used to help build space shuttles. Now, he helps build Chrysler 200s.
Before each car is painted, it must be thoroughly cleaned to remove any marks or tiny fibers they may have picked up while in the body shop. But the car doesn't just get an ordinary car wash. From soapy water to phosphate to electrically charged ions, each car is put through a total of seven baths and seven showers. Only when the car is absolutely spotless is it ready for electric coating. Our electrically charged layer of primer that creates yet another layer of defense against a car's worst enemy, corrosion. Like a barbecue chicken on a rotisserie, the 200 is now turned upside down and that's not just to be acrobatic. This impressive maneuver is to ensure that every gap and seam has been filled with sealant. That sounds easy enough, but because those gaps and seams are underneath the car, getting the sealant to stay there without gravity pulling it away has always been a challenge. Until now. Thanks to this new rotating carrier, the sealant doesn't drip off the car, but instead drips into the car, filling every nook and cranny for an even better seal. Makes sense, right? The result is a seal that keeps moisture, dust, and highway noise out of the car for an even quieter ride. Now the car is ready for paint. Well, almost ready. First, it needs to be dusted, and there's no better dusting feather than an ostrich feather. Unlike other materials, ostrich feathers are covered with hundreds of tiny hooks that act like claws, grabbing onto even the smallest dust particles and carrying them away from the car. Now the car is ready for paint. The all-new Chrysler 200 comes in 10 colors, but there's more to this paint than meets the eye. See, this is tri-coat paint, specially formulated for a deeper three-dimensional appearance and to give the car an added protection against, yep, you guessed it, corrosion. Now we've come to the final part of the tour. To uphold Chrysler's world-class manufacturing standards, the finished cars are all brought here to the Quality Assurance Center for one last inspection. Once the cars are given the all-clear by the Chrysler Quality Team, they are then signed off and shipped out to dealers around the country. Okay, you gonna buy one? What do you think? Pretty clean place to work? A lot of people have the impression, and that's one of the concerns that I've heard a lot of people talk about down here in the Southeast Automotive, that they're having a hard time getting people to come to work in the industry because they have the impression that these are dirty places to work when actually they're probably as clean as a cafeteria pretty much throughout the whole entire place and there's a certainly a lot of technology involved so it's a pretty cool place to work I think. Okay body in white we do sub-assembly body panels framing ceiling finishing and dimensional and these are just some photos I'll snap through pretty quickly this is a sub-assembly process another sub-assembly process where we're building up the apertures side apertures and that's really all the body panels that are stamped and produced and sub-assembled in body and then welded together so that the car is a metal frame. By the way, body, there's not a lot of human beings working in there. Most of it is pretty automated in body shop. In assembly, what do you think? You think it's mostly automated before we get there? No. It's like anti-automated. I mean, they have equipment that helps them build the cars, but it's almost all people-based in assembly. Uh, this slide is the sealing process because you get to carbon monoxide, different things that can enter the body. There are safety requirements of the sealing as well as the water intrusion, uh, corrosion, uh, noise. You seal the outside from the car to try to minimize the uh, uh, sound on the highway. Dimensional fits. This, is a, this gives them fits. This is one of their primary quality metrics are fits, which is really a difficult thing to manage. There are certain specifications for gaps and how the hood fits, how the trunk fits, door closing effort, gaps in the door, all these things.
<coughs> of car goes to paint. These are the processes of paint, phosphate, electric coat, e-coat oven, sealer, primer paint, primer sealer oven. They put on the base coat and the clear coat, and the car is off to assembly. Don't ask me too much about paint or body. I, I didn't spend my time there. Uh, one of our things in assembly, we'd talk about paint, and we'd say this a little bit more derogatory, but we'd say, if you can pee, you can paint. You know, that was our joke. We, we were pretty proud of putting the car together. We'd always have these competitions with the other shops. But. So that's a control room for paint. A uh, few pictures, phosphate, the purpose is to prepare the body surface for painting. Uh, E-coat, is purpose is to prevent corrosion from, for the body surfaces. And then prime it so that the paint adheres to it. Um, the purpose of the primer and the primer coat booth is to, is to provide bonding surface between electric coat and the base coat. And then sealer, both ovens, the purpose is to prevent rust. And there's some really great pictures in that video of the sealer, how they flip the car upside down and the robots apply all the sealer to all the joints in the car. Really cool. And it's something they didn't have when I was at a car. They'd apply sealer from the bottom, and naturally it would drop off and leak and create a mess. And we didn't get great sealing, so they flip the car now and they seal it from the top with robotics, and it kind of goes down into the vehicle. It really, really helps seal the car. Uh, by the way, and when they're painting the car, and they've been doing this for years, and a lot of companies have been doing this for years, they change the paint color depending on the cars that's coming in the booth. So they have every part every cycle. I want a white one, I can make a white one, red one, blue one, whatever the colors are. There's no changeover for paint. Paint happens automatically within cycle. Now we're to assembly. Assembly, we call the plan itself, I think, uh, Jay, final assembly. But we're talking about body paint and assembly total. We're talking about the OEM at its final point where the car is built. In the assembly plant, we refer to assembly as something separate from body and paint, and we also break assembly down to trim, chassis, final, and reprocess. There are like four departments within assembly, and each one is a complex, as not, maybe not as complex, but size, they're probably pretty similar in the responsibilities to build the car to body or paint. So you essentially, you, you have really about a body, paint, and assembly, you have four areas that are about the same size as either body or paint. So it's a large, large place in assembly. And this is assembly at CHAP. So let me explain this, because you're going to be tested on every detail of it. It's a joke. So um, I'm going to break this down a little bit, but you know, I'll show you a little section of it. But the car is coming out of paint. So we went through body. Everywhere you see the dash line, that's the car is above you. So it's, it's traveling in the air above you. So you can see the conveyor and the cars are coming across. We go through paint. And if you can read that, can, can you read that? It says broadcast. Right there at that point, you see the dash line. It's really saying there's an electronic signal coming from paint to all the suppliers and to all the suppliers internal to the plant. At this point, after the car is painted, it is born. It, it, it receives a VIN number. Once it receives that VIN number, all the build requirements for that car are defined. Meaning, I know that it's going to have a slate instrument panel with GPS. I know it's going to have 16-inch alloy rims of this, si of this type. I know it's going to have side curtain airbags. Everything about the car is known. So at this point, we can broadcast electronically to everyone. Here's a car that's coming in sequenced order, and you know the order, and you have to be prepared to build it. So that means a lot of people can start responding to that broadcast and ordering material and sequencing material to be able to build the car when it arrives. So for instance, if you look, the yellow box or gold box synchronized supplier along the top, you see all these suppliers, they're not in the plant, they're down the road somewhere. These are factories that are working down the road. And we have a tire and wheel company, we have a seat build company, we have a front and rear fascia, those are bumpers. We have front cooling module with the radiator and the headlamps, it's all one unit. Uh, we have the instrument panel supplier. And the poor instrument panel supplier is the one that has the shortest time frame. Because the instrument panel is installed right here. This back wall where the dash line is, so if you're standing in the plant and you're looking, you see a back wall and you see up to 70 cars on the back wall. Not being built, they're up in the air and they're in sequence coming to assembly. So if I have one minute cycle, 50 second cycle, 51 actually, <clears throat> how long do I have before a car accident paint gets to a trim? We're, about an hour, yeah. So now supplier goes, well, I have one hour, right? And then how long does it take for the car to go around this loop and this loop to this point? There's probably about 50 cars in each line as, as it goes through the process. So you can see got about two and a half hours, maybe, right? Three hours. If there has been some significant downtime in body or paint, this back wall continues to move. It's a fast chain. It'll pull all the cars through. So I've just lost an hour. So if the back wall has no cars on it, I only have about two hours to build the instrument panel, deliver at line side. So the minute the car exits paint, we'll use the instrument panel supplier as an example. They get an order that says, I need a slate gray with GPS and this and that on the instrument panel. They immediately start building this instrument panel in sequence. And then the next one that comes out of paint will be the next one on their line. And that instrument panel has to go through the entire build process, be loaded on a truck, be delivered to Sterling Heights assembly plant, taken out to the line in batches of eight units on a rack and loaded in order. And when the car arrives, that instrument panel has to be there. That's, that's, cord that's quite a bit of coordination. So is there a need for a warehouse? No. It, do we have the ability to build every part every cycle? Yes. They're flexible enough in their manufacturing process at that plant to build whatever they're broadcast in sequence order. 
and their equipment and their systems and their methods are set up to be able to do that. No, no inventory required from that supplier. So here they are. I guess I should have waited until I got here. This is the overhead conveyor little symbol. These are the suppliers. They're synchronized suppliers. Synchronized suppliers. One of the strategies to handle mixed model assembly. So this is the plant, actually. You see the cars? These are up above. Here's a human, right? So these are coming. This is paint. This is assembly. And there are 70 cars on the back wall. Okay, now we're going to break this down, little pieces. This is assembly, trim. And the car drops down at this point as it comes across the back wall, if you see the dash line. This is a pick and pack. This is what we call the miscellaneous pick and pack because there's a multitude of parts that go in the car that you only have 19 feet to store. And there's so much option content in the car that we have a non-value added, this is a key point, a non-value added person picking the parts for each individual unit, putting them in a container and setting it in the floor pan of the car. Right? So this person's non-value added, but it's taking away a major problem. We don't have to store the material line side. And we pretty much eliminate the likelihood of failure if we error proof the picking process. So they put on the car whatever travels to them. No decision to be made by the operator. No stock on the line, no walking to get it. All of that's eliminated. We pay for that with the non-value added person sequencing it. So they put the tub in the floor pan of the car. Two hours later, it's empty. And then that empty container goes back to the pick area. One of the strategies to handle option content of the vehicle. So it's a pick and pack. Harnesses are synchronized because harnesses come from Mexico and they come just in tons. So we have what we call CCAs, or this large, and we probably have 50 plus harnesses of different variety, both body and, and engine. Meaning, there's no way we could store these things on the side of the line. 50 of these on the side of the line would almost take up half a line, right? So how do we handle that? We have an area off to the side of the line because these come from Mexico, and Mexico suppliers can't handle the broadcast from paint. They can't sequence the delivery to us. So we get it just in tons, and we sequence it off of the side of the line. So we're, we have an employee off the side of the line. He receives the broadcast from paint, he or she, sees the order of the build, it's broken out by harness, engine and body harness, and they sequence them on a rack, and they push these racks back and forth to the line. Operator doesn't have to make a decision. They just simply take the harness that's next in sequence, and they put it on the car. So we're inter again, we're internally sequencing parts. We also do it with all the body moldings and with a convertible top. They do not come sequenced to the plant. We sequence those. Now we have three people that are non-value added that are sequencing material so that the person at the operation that actually adds value is not bothered with all of this mix and all of these problems and all of this line side stock. That's, a synchronized, that's synchronized material, internal to the plant, non-value added. And then we have a few instances in the plant where we have pick lights. Now this just aids the operator because there's just multitudes of selections that have to be made, and it's almost impossible for people to make, not make error. So we error-proof the loading into the rack of the multitude of key packages. The operator sees the light, car comes in station, it lights up which key package to use. They acknowledge, they take the key package. And here's the IP install, as we said, synchronized supplier. So when the car gets around to this point, we install. This is a little different. This is brake line build assembly, meaning we actually build up the brake line offline. Remember, the car's on a chain, and it's going through the conveyor at 51 seconds. But we have an offline process where we build the brake assembly up, and we sequence and deliver it, as though we're a uh, synchronized supplier, but we're internal to the plant. So it's not a company building it and delivering it in sequence. It's the plant itself building it and delivering it line side in sequence. So that's brake line build. So it's a synchronized build. Here, is that value added or non value added? Very good. Who said that? So you're always right with it, that's good. Yeah. And then glass install. We're, we're assembling, we're putting the windshield glass and the backlight glass in four door sedans. Next car comes in station, it's a convertible. Different, different glass for the, uh, for the windshield glass, not the same glass. Uh, doesn't take a backlight glass. Convertible top has it built into the top. So the glass install equipment, robotics that install the glass, they're flexible. They know that the car coming into station is a convertible. They install convertible glass for the convertible. So convertible comes in station. This glass install robotic system says, oh, my turn. And it picks its glass up and it places it in the uh, car. Next car comes in, it's a sedan. The other system goes, oh, my turn. It picks glass up, installs the front, installs the rear. Flexible equipment, right? So there's no changeover, there's no SMED required. The glass install equipment systems can handle every part every cycle, right? Up, oh, still no need for inventory. No warehousing. So here's just some photos. When a car comes into trim, we do two things. You don't see the other one, but we hang, hang a track sheet off of the front of it. When it goes into chassis, it has a chassis track sheet. When it goes into final, it has a final track sheet. The track sheet tells the operators what are the build requirements. 
They know in their station that I look at this box. This box tells me what to pick. This really aids them in picking the right parts. These are for jobs that actually have a variety of parts on the side of the line that can fit in the 19 feet, but they as operators have to make decisions on which one to put on the car. Track sheet tells them. They also have CRTs in every station and assembly. Car comes into station, the system knows, I don't know, I'm not very technical. System knows which car's coming into station. Ah, here's car one, two, three. Here's all the things you need to know about car one, two, three for job three. So they see it on the CRT. Something goes wrong, they can tag the car electronically. So the car now has a failure on it with the CRT. The bingo helps them build. Here's wiring harnesses. As you can see, somebody's pre-sequencing these, right? They don't ship these in a truck this way. Right? So somebody's taking these out of the big containers, ergo problems, right? and they're sequencing them in order so that they can be delivered to the line in sequenced order. Instrument panels can either be built at a supply or they can be built at the plant. At our plant, early on in the 90s, up to about 2000, we built our own instrument panels. So they were all built internally, they were all sequenced. We got the broadcast from paint just like the supplier outside does now. We knew what to build, we built the next one that came out of paint. And it would go around the loop, it go in the overhead, it go over in the conveyor and it come down to the car, sequenced order of build. So the car that's coming into station had the instrument panel there. Now a supplier delivers some in batches of eight in sequenced order. Again, no inventory, every part, every cycle, EPE1. Here's a guy, poor guy putting it in. Actually, this is, this is the rack that holds them. Again, there's eight in a rack. This is called a sail rail. They, they can load up to three racks on the sail rail and it'll cycle the rack of eight forward and the next one follows behind it and they keep loading the sail rail up with racks of eight. All of them in sequenced order from broadcast from paint. IP install also. Here's glass install. Not a great picture. <laughs> Convertible four-door EPE of one. Okay, we're going to trim and chassis both here. Trim four and chassis. Front fascia install. This is, should be front cooling module install. Our synchronized suppliers, you see. So the parts are arriving in these two stations. That's the point at which they install them in sequence order from the supplier. Again, EPE of one, no warehouse required. Door pick and pack. Let's see what do we have here? Synchronized material. Is this value add? Not value added. But on a door line, door lines are crammed in pretty tight and there's a ton of options on doors. Just all kinds of material on a door line. You can hardly walk down the aisle. And if you're using high lows, you might get hit. Door lines are so congested. So what did we do? We took all the material off, most of the material off the door line. We put it at the back of the line. We have this elaborate little system where two people are walking around picking parts for the door line, setting them on the carrier. The carrier has a metal frame. This is uh, car number 567. Here's 567. The, the carrier starts moving down the line. The people are picking their parts out of the container building the door so that we can get all the material off the door time, eliminate all the walk time, eliminate the, the need to make a decision and otherwise, it would be very, very difficult to put this, these parts on the line. So it's non-value added, it's waste, but it's far more important to spend your money on that waste than have the operation, the direct labor operation that adds value to be burdened with it. So they pick the parts, it's built around the door line, comes to the other side, the empty container goes back into the system. Uh, yes? There's a, there's a separate line for each door? No, no, that's a good question. We have both, we have both, uh, two-door convertible door, which is much larger, and a four-door sedan. But they, that's a good point. I missed that. But the, the carriers for the doors are flexible to handle either. So they can build any sequence on the door line, whether it be convertible or whether it be four-door sedan. Again, so that, so that they can build every part every cycle on the door line. No two lines. But we do have two lines for the convertible at some point. I'll, I'll get to that when we get to final. But thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> And then here's the front suspension loop. That's where we build the chassis front suspension up. It's kind of in the back. This is a chassis process. Here's the rear suspension. Front suspension comes around and it gets the rear suspensions being built. These two are married up. But before that happens, the engine's dressed and it's sent to the front suspension loop. So this whole chassis area, building the underbody of the chassis up, is occurring and it's being injected into the assembly process. Now these are very complex operations. These aren't simple little offline processes. These are major processes. But technically, they're not part of the moving conveyor. Even though they are, they're on a 50-second cycle and they have moving conveyor, their product's being injected into the, where the car is being produced. And uh, so they are, that's synchronized build. Is that value added? Yes. Being built off the main line and being injected into the main line, the underbody chassis. And then chassis decking, brake pedal push, these are flexible equipment. So the decking process is, and everybody's somewhat familiar with, I got a couple of photos, it's where the chassis and the body come together. The chassis, remember the, bo the body's been going through trim and the chassis is being built up offline. These two are coming together and they're married and they're put together. Now the, the chassis is married to the body and that happens here. That's where this whole air process back here marries up with the body that's coming through. And so therefore this whole decking cell is flexible. The carriers are flexible. They actually, the convertible is longer than the four-door sedan. So the carriers must be adjustable to the uh, car that's being built. 
So you can imagine if I'm building carriers to hold these cars and they're different quite a bit, that there's a lot of engineering design and a lot of thought put into the flexibility of these systems to where they can change within a cycle. So it doesn't matter whether I run five convertibles in a row or convertible four-door sedan one after the other. The system to hold the chassis is flexible and the decking cell is flexible so it can deck the car regardless of which one comes in station. So that's a lot of investment. That's probably millions of dollars of investment to be able to achieve the ability to build every part every cycle. Remember when we talked about SMED, money's no object? Money's no object if your intent is to get rid of your whip and reduce your lead time because it's a much, much greater sin than any investment in a single process would be. Again, remember uh, Indy 500. They spend millions to make sure that they can put gas in a car and change tires because what's at stake is great. Same in manufacturing. Money's no expense in order to achieve every part, every cycle. So there's a great deal of expense put into these systems to be able to handle that complexity. Here's a door build area. Don't mess with either one of these women. You would lose, both verbally and physically. <laughs> uh, so as you can see on the door line, you see that container? That's carrying the parts from the pick and pack. Remember, we had that whole area that's picking parts. And it's, there's a frame welded onto the carrier. So it has the parts that are related to that door. And here's a bingo sheet that tells them other requirements that they have relative to that door. So they know exactly what to do and they have all their material with them. And the, the motors that they use to shoot screws, they, they, they are operating with the line or their battery pack. I think, can't see them in the hand. Some of them have battery packs that are torque controllable to national standards off a of battery. So they can use those without wires or... <clears throat> here's the engine pallet line. We talked about that earlier, just a photo of that. That gets built up and it goes over to the front suspension loop. That's John Badalamenti. I remember him. So he's loading the engines up on the chain. The chain goes up, you can see. It goes up and goes over and it goes to the front suspension loop. So the engine's built ready. Uh, chassis suspension loop. Here's body coming in for decking. You see the chassis on the pallet? Body coming from trim, chassis coming from chassis. Right? And this is where they go together. So we secure the two. So now the whole car's together going into the fine line. Another example, another example. How about that one? That's Henry Ford putting the, the body with the chassis. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, but the carpets are sequenced internally also, non-value added, delivered to the line, because they take about 50 yards of space if we were to put them on the line. They're large and there's a lot of different colors and two different cars. So they sequence them offline and deliver them in sequenced order. Front fascia stall sequenced also. Underbody, we didn't have this at our plant, but this is good because people get injured when they're working underbody like this, and they're doing that all day, and there are still processes. I think Kia still works that way. Hyundai's body, I think, flips up, but Kia's body doesn't. So you got people that are looking up at the car like this with their neck cocked, doing their work. There's not many processes like that, but there's enough to where it's, it's, it's not ergonomically friendly, but this is much better. Okay, so now we're in the final line. We, we built the chassis up. We built the, uh, we installed many of the components in the glass and the wiring harnesses into the, the body. We married the two. Now we're going into chassis, or final, I'm sorry. Um, and I, I just mentioned it, carpet sequenced. Uh, trunk pick and pack. There's a multitude of items that go in the trunk. Smoker's package nets, all the you know, warrant, uh, warranty books, a lot of different things that go in the trunk. And by the way, an ungodly number of variety, different languages, just tons and tons of material that there's so much variety in the trunk, it's difficult to give all that variety to the operator. So we have a person that picks it by vehicle and delivers it just on a conveyor to the, to the car. Uh, so those are synchronized material, synchronized material, value added, non-value added, non-value added. We're conceding. <laughs> we got to factor in some way. We got to design waste into this. I mean, because the consequence otherwise is too difficult. Uh, so we have what did we just put seat install, tire and wheel install. Those are both synchronized suppliers. Is that value added or non value added? Value added. They're being built by our supplier, delivered to the line in sequenced order. Every part, every cycle. No need for inventory. AC fill. Huntsville electrical test. We say Huntsville because Huntsville produced all the electrical test systems for all of the plants in Chrysler. So any plant you go in Chrysler that said, hey, you know, go over to Huntsville test on final. It's referred to as Huntsville test, but it comes out of Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and uh, convertible glass adjust. We're, we're putting the top, we, the top's on, but it's not adjusted and it's a nightmare. All the glass, the potential for water leak, wind noise. So there's a whole spur line for that. These, this is flexible equipment because the AC system, the AC fill, uh, the, fuel, the electrical test, and the glass adjusts are all equipment capabilities that have been factored into the process to handle the complexity. So these are flexible equipment systems. Uh, door install, again, that's a synchronized build. If you see the dash line, remember this is the overhead conveyor, right? So the, the, the doors were built up on the door line. They went up and disappeared. Nobody cared anymore. They go across the plant. 
they come down to this point on final line, we're done building the interior of the car. There's no more work to be done inside the car. Let's put the doors back on. So they arrive in sequenced order from the door line. So the door line is really a sequenced offline build that injects back into the line. That's the AC fill. That causes us a lot of fits. And this is a seat conveyor. This is pretty interesting how the seats work. The truck backs up to the dock. They connect to the conveyor on the truck itself. And the conveyor system sucks all the seats off of the truck. Nobody unloads it. Goes right up into the overhead conveyor for the seats in sequenced order and comes down to the line at the point of installation. So the trucks have the equipment systems in to marry up with the conveyor system in the assembly plant and pull the seats off in order automatically. So they're kind of an extension of the conveyor system, the truck itself. And they're sequenced. Doors on. And then the tire and wheel conveyor. So these are coming. There's multitudes of different varieties of tires and wheels that go on the cars. Those are all built at another plant. We used to do this internally also. And then we farmed that out to a supplier. But we would build up the tire and wheel assemblies. We had a conveyor. So they would deliver it to the line to be installed in sequenced order of car. But now it's done outside of the plant. Same thing, but they just deliver it. Every part, every cycle. Yes? Doesn't that make your process less, less efficient when you're having all of that waste? Yes, but you can't operate just in time without it. Think about here's that's a good question, but let, let me explain. Are you talking about all these? You're talking about this whole concept, uh, all these methods. Well, I'm talking about farm, when you keep farming it out to uh, your suppliers and having to deliver just the funds instead of you used to create yourself. It's just... Well, it's not necessarily waste because you're you're contracting a price with them. You're saying, hey, can you do this for a hundred? You're saying, can you do this for uh, can you do this for 150 dollars? And we said because our cost is 165, and they say, yeah, we could do it for 150 dollars, and then and then we say. Good, I'm a hero, I'll get a bonus, I can buy summer cottage, and then they'll promote me and it'll be somebody else's problem. That's what happens, right? And then they find out that the supplier can't build it as well as they could. I, I can tell you that. And then they have all kinds of supplier problems. And they're fighting this now because somehow they, what they've done, and this is, a, this is a really good question. This is a really good question because what they've done is they saw the good sheep as a problem. These lazy UAW workers that don't care and all these defects and problems we're having in this outline downtime, let's get somebody who knows what they're doing to build a tire and wheel assembly. The reality is building tires and wheels in sequence is very hard to do. And also, the reality is you're not listening to the people that build the tire and wheels that need stuff that you're not giving them. But rather than acknowledge that problem, you just said, let's just give it to somebody else and I can be a hero. Now you struggle with that decision. Because they typically, if you own your own processes and you can produce it yourself, you have full control. What you're really saying is, I don't trust me to do my own work. It's a bad strategy, in my opinion. But it's a very good question. Theoretically, it's cheaper, at least at the point of signing the contract. Right? So that's a good question. Are they we, sourcing? Uh, yes. Yeah, they're sole sourcing. And, and, and I've seen this. We were in pricing in Huntsville. Priced the uh, instrument cluster for this car from Huntsville, and it was $212. And uh, Nip and Denzo quoted it because we were in competition. You know, we, were, we had to be profitable. They quoted it at like $200. And we're going, how can they do that? Because when we looked at the price breakdown, the labor was 7 bucks. How are you able to go like 15 bucks under our, our quoted price? We know what the material is. Our plant and equipment's here. How on earth are you able to do this? What they're doing is they're what we call buying business. Let's just get the business. Then we'll just, we'll just destroy, them with, destroy them with price changes and problems. And once they get the business, remember, here's the whole incentive thing. They get the business. Everybody's a hero at their company. And then they, they meet together and say, how do we survive now, now that we've got it? But at Chrysler, somebody goes, wahoo, I, you know, I get a big bonus. Look what I did. I saved the company a lot of money. But the reality is it's a bad deal. And we can just see it in, in the costing of it, that it couldn't possibly be true. But think about that for a minute, this expensive, overpriced UAW labor, right? $7 in a $210 product. Let's just cut their wages in half. Okay, $206. It's really almost meaningless, the labor piece of that. It was so capital intensive in the electronic division anyway that the labor was a small, small part of the cost. So we could be very competitive, but we couldn't. I remember, you know, John Evans, right? He worked in finance at the time. And John said, hey, I, you know, John's got a sense of humor. And plant manager said, well, can we cut some of the variable burden out? And then he just kind of shook his head and said, well, you know what? We could build it in the parking lot with no plant, no equipment, then we could say it's cheap enough, you know, because it was just absurd. We knew what they were doing, but that was going on quite a bit, which really leads into the fact that people were giving away the ship. They were just making deals to look like heroes, but they weren't getting any value out of it. So it's a very good, very observant, good, good question. So tire install, and this is the spur line. Look at all these bingo sheets. We use track sheets. So this line, when the car got near the end of final, all convertibles went off on another line. It was probably about 100 yards long. And because there's so much complexity in the build of this convertible and setting the glass and the hardtop convertible and all this, that it couldn't be handled in the same station that the car was being built. So that was a, an expensive addition to the plant, very expensive, because we had to dig trenches for people to stand down and build board, uh, doors. Uh, but again, we have to achieve this ability to build every part every cycle, at, at no matter what cost. That's how we can produce 5 million pounds of material a day and have no warehouse. 
no warehouse and have a plant in the industrial park of Auburn with a warehouse larger than their manufacturing facility. Small operation. <clears throat> and the final, the force. Uh, I love Bob. So Bob, Bob stayed at the end of final. He had an office probably as big as this room. Well, maybe not quite that big, but he's never in it. He's always at the end of final. And if you ever go, this is another little Bob story. New, new people come in and say, I'm going to send Bob an email. <laughs> don't. Don't send him an email. He'll take your head off. He, he just, he'd say, don't send me an email. He said, I'm at the end of final. If you've got something to say, I'm here. You come and talk to me. He hated email. And then he'd say, I know how to use email. I don't want to use email. I'm here. I have no better place to be than right here. So he's a crazy guy. Love them. But that's where he'd be. This is a car coming off final, and he's here an awful lot. He actually took a McDonald's table. Uh, you know those McDonald's table with the little seats, and they're all bolted to the floor. Had it bolted to the floor at the end of final with the seats bolted to the floor, all footprinted, and his staff would stand in line at the beginning of the day, and he'd have them in two set down while he gave them their marching orders. That's not respect for people. <laughs> that, that's personality-dependent operations, not process-dependent. They had a great process, but he couldn't unlearn this behavior. It was kind of inherent in his DNA. But it was great. It was great to watch as long as you weren't the guy talking to him. All right, so that's the plant. Uh, now in reprocess, all of these are flexible equipment systems. Headlight aim, wheel alignment, vehicle dynamic test, we called it rolls, water test. Every one of those systems could take either a convertible or a four-door sedan and they could adjust their program to it. Flexible. Could run every part, every cycle. Didn't matter what came down the line. And this was another example of pick lights, body side moldings, ungodly number of colors, different types of body side moldings. I mean, we had a matrix of body side moldings, half the size of this room. Nobody could possibly manage that themselves. So we had to scan the parts into location and when the car came, the operator, the light would come on and say, get those. Those are the, those are the parts that go on the car. Because it was just too complex to manage. <clears throat> That's the molding install operation. That's the water test booth. We didn't make these cars, by the way. This is just a picture of it. I wish we had. But <laughs> That's reprocess. That's, you don't want cars here. But unfortunately, if you have a first pass yield of 85 90%, there are going to be cars there. Because right? you're losing 10% of your vehicles. And if you get overwhelmed in process because you don't have robust process, it's not error-proofed, and you're trusting the training of a person, you're going to always have this place full. Because how, can you trust people to inspect quality? No, no, no. You ask them to, they can help you. Maybe you can design the process so they can see things, but if you're just trusting it because your process isn't robust enough, you're gonna fill reprocess up with defects. And uh, AC, we had a, our big problems system here primarily were brake and AC fill, not meeting parameters, electrical test failures, cut wires, all kinds of problems, ugly stuff. <clears throat> so in body and white, just to summarize, we have flexible equipment, synchronized material, synchronized supplier. We talk about these strategies. Body. There's probably more, but I don't know enough about it. Quality systems, these are the things critical to body. And they have very robust methods of control for sealing, weld integrity, studs and holes, and dimensional fits. Paint, primer application, paint application. The application, the method, the path for the, diff the different cars has a different program than the application of the paint and the paint color. All of these are very flexible systems. Sealing application, how we seal each car because they get sealed differently. Quality system, per foam and sealers. Dirt and paint, sags and runs, orange peel. Those are the quality systems in paint that have to be managed. Got them running over, aren't I? Almost on. Hang tight. These are all the systems that are flexible in assembly. I won't read them, but this is posted. These are all the flexible equipment systems. These are all the synchronized material internal to the plant, synchronized suppliers, synchronized build. I'm sure I missed some of them, but this is how the plant manages mixed model assembly. All these strategies. Um, CRPs I mentioned to broadcast, track sheets, and we have mixed operations targeted by work elements. For example, we put side airbags with convertible top because you don't have side airbags in a convertible. So why don't you put the side airbags in when a convertible comes, put the top on. So you handle the mix and how you do your job assignment. And here's assemblies, quality systems. These are critical. Torque's probably very critical. Electrical, water leaks, in-system damage, BSR, bus weak and rattle brakes, and AC fill. Very robust quality systems to handle these that drive you to process to make improvement. Here's your test. Can you do that for me? Thank you, sorry. 